Hey everybody. I'm sorry. Welcome to the um, Q and A. Is this better? Not a, not too loud. Um, on stage here with me are a number of the uh, core committers. There's a few of us absent as well for a number of reasons, but maybe let's do quick intros for those um, who have not met all of the, the people here. You want to start, Angie? Sure. So um, I'm, uh, can you hear me okay? <clears throat> Hello. That's better? Okay. So my name is Angie Byron, or I go by WebChick on Drupal.org and Twitter and various other places. Um, I was the Drupal 7 release manager, committer person, and now I uh, also help out with Drupal 8, um, uh, working mostly on user-facing stuff, like uh, making sure our features make sense to end users and site builders and all that kind of stuff. Um, but I'm basically here to help make the community awesome. So. Hi, I'm Alex Pott. I'm one of the framework managers for Drupal 8. I commit stuff to Crawl. I work for Chapter 3, and I'm also responsible for configuration management in Drupal 8. I'm Jess. My name is uh, my username is xjm on Drupal.org, um, and I'm a release manager for Drupal 8. I've I've been committing to Core for about a month now, um, and I also worked on the Views and Core initiative back in 2012 and 13. Awesome. My name is Dries. I, I assume most of you have met me, but um, I started the Drupal project. <laughs> um, also in the room, we actually have a lot of prominent contributors to, uh, you know, to Drupal 8 specifically, but you know, Drupal in general. And so what we're hoping to do is to make this very collaborative, like make this a discussion. So what we'll most likely end up doing is pulling those of you in the room as well. So maybe to help us see who's here, if you have contributed to Drupal 8 or if you have a patch in Drupal 8, maybe you can stand up real quick so we can kind of spot where all of the people are. Oh, wow. Yeah. A lot of you, huh? Stand <laughs> up, yeah. All right. So we may call upon you. Um, so the way we organize these sessions is, um, obviously, we post them on the DrupalCon website, and then we invite people to ask questions. Um, we didn't have that many questions, so we're hoping to get a lot of questions from the room. Um, to do so, we're going to ask you to uh, get up and you know walk to the mic because this session is recorded and so unless you use the mic in the middle of the room um, the people who will be listening to this um, you know will not get the question so when you do have a question please walk up to the mic and if you can start walking up to the mic right now um, I think we have one or two questions that came in maybe we can start with those and then please feel free to ask us any kind of question don't be afraid all right, do so bite, but just a little. So. <laughs> Speak for yourself, Angie. <laughs> <laughs> so the first, the first question we got through the website is a question from uh, Gappel. Um, and his question, or her question, not sure, is, um, is as follows. While the critical issue count has, you know, has been decreasing at a, at a healthy, steady pace, um, that's not the case for major issues in Drupal 8, and in fact, there's been a slight increase, uh, as was pointed out in the question, and the question is, is this a concern for the quality of the Drupal 8 release? And also, what are we going to do about it? And um, I was thinking maybe, Jess, you want to answer a question in yeah. your role as release manager? Sure. Um, so, uh, it, just to give some background information, some specific numbers for that question, um, right now, I think we're at 25 critical issues that are still open, um, down from 130 in, in November of last year. So in six months, we've gone from 130 critical issues to 25. Those are the issues that specifically block release. 24. 24. 24. Ooh. <laughs> That's a new low, by the way, since um, I think that we've had more than that since the release of Drupal 7. So that's four years, all-time minimum, I, as far as I know, which is cool. Um, but then there, there's another, a, 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 there's four priorities of issues. There's the criticals that block release. There, and then there's major issues, which we've agreed are pretty nasty, um, could be 
uh, severe for a particular site or a particular module or use case, um, but aren't significant enough to say no one in the world can have a supported release of Drupal 8 yet. Um, and then there's normal and minor issues. And right now there are um, over 800, nearly 900 major issues, um, which sounds pretty terrifying, right? Like 900 nasty problems that someone could un encounter with a website. Um, a lot of these are legitimately problematic bugs and we need help to fix them. Um, in, in fact, a lot of people who look for ways to contribute to core, they hear that they're supposed to work on release blockers because that's the thing that gets duplicate done, right? And they go and look at the list of 25 release blockers um, and they, they're just, they don't know where to start because those issues move quickly, they're complicated. Major issues, on the other hand, are a fantastic way to help because these are the bugs that you're going to encounter when you start building out Drupal 8 sites for clients, when you start using Drupal 8 um, in your own situation. However, I will also say that of those 900 issues, um, all of them aren't necessarily relevant anymore. Uh, they, we triage the critical issue queue uh, on a biweekly basis, but the major issues, we just don't have the resources to do that. And some of them have been sitting around for two years, three years, or some, maybe even four years, or even from the Drupal 7 cycle, and might not actually be relevant anymore. So to that end, we're having a sprint tomorrow. Um, if, if, if you don't know, Friday of DrupalCon is the main sprint day. There will be hundreds of people here working on Drupal core, Drupal contributed modules, uh, Drupal testing infrastructure, all kinds of things. And one of the sprints we're holding is a sprint to triage the major issues, which means going through all of them, determining if they're still relevant, making a decision about when we should solve them. So please come help with that. Um, this is the first time we've tried something like this at a con during the Drupal 8 cycle, so it's kind of an experiment. Um, but we have two fantastically smart sprint leads who will be there helping you both experience Drupal 8 contributors. And I also just want to note, even though triaging issues isn't something that um, you, you won't be creating patches for these issues, you'll just be reading through them and researching them, it's still a contribution that merits uh, a commit mention in the Drupal commit log. We've started crediting people who do significant reviews on issues, and this is a kind of significant review. So I will make sure that you're credited in the commit mention for the issue if you do help with that sprint. Great answer. Thank you. <laughs> Philip? Let's uh, take a question from the audience, maybe. Um, if you want, introduce yourself and you know your name, where you work. That, that usually helps us a little bit. Uh, my name is Ray. I work for the International Fund for Animal Welfare, which is a huge uh, nonprofit organization. We currently use Drupal 6. And um, I'm in the unique position of trying to defend uh, or at least um, appropriately explain why we should go to Drupal 8 versus some of the competitors like not Drupal 7, but WordPress or other. Um, and it's interesting because I'm in a room uh, and I'm also uh, really, I like Drupal. I'm, it's sort of like preaching to the crowd, but if you were to be in a sales position and say this is what Drupal 8 will really do well, against the other possible CMSs out there. Uh, that would be very useful for me um, and maybe hopefully for other people that are in the position of either selling Drupal or, um, or just using it. So I guess that's that. A, that's, a, that's a great question. Um, <laughs> it's also a complex question, obviously. Um, you know, because there's so many, I mean, there's so many different systems. Um, the way Drupal competes against them, you know, differs from system to system. But I think in, you know, the way I would answer this question in general is that, you know, I honestly believe that Drupal 8, you know, will make a huge leap forward, uh, especially compared to the other open source systems. Um, you know, things like object-oriented object programming, embracing Symfony, you know, fixing some of the problems that we fixed uh, in Drupal 8, you know, from configuration management to, how you know caching works? I think um, depending on your situation and your needs, um, you know, like sort of the robustness and the scalability of Drupal 8, I think, um, are significantly improved uh, compared to Drupal 7, but also compared to competitors. But then also, um, in terms of you know content creation, usability improvements, like you know you mentioned WordPress, but traditionally. 
people have said that WordPress is much easier to use or for, for content creators and Drupal 8. And so one of the things that we've done is we've sort of, you know, spent a lo lot of time and effort in making uh, the authoring experience of Drupal 8 much better. And we've, been, we've done very quick, unofficial hallway testing of Drupal 8 versus WordPress. And um, what we found is that um, the user experience for content creators of Drupal 8 is on par or slightly better than it was uh, of WordPress. Now, you know, things may have changed since we've done these testing in, in, in WordPress and also in Drupal, so. Um, but I do think in general, you know, you can um, share that we've made a lot of improvements all over the map, whether it's for developers, for, you know, DevOps people that need to scale uh, Drupal 8 or, you know, people that actually have to use uh, Drupal as a content creator. So, and we actually have a great page um, that you may want to check out. It's, uh, you know, drupal.org slash drupal-8.0.0, I believe it is. It's off the main page of drupal.org and you can get an overview of all of the changes. Sorry. It's also slash eight. Uh, or slash it's eight. Also slash eight. That's okay, it. got it. I like, I like Holly's thing where it's like, because we're nerds, we have to have a URL with both a dot and a slash in it, so that's <laughs> fun. Um, and a hyphen too. Um, can I tag on to what yeah, you absolutely. just said? Okay, yeah, because I, I think that was, a, that was a fantastic question. I think a lot of people are in that position where, um, especially if you're on Drupal 6, the, you know, the leap from 6 to 8 is going to be significant. Even the leap, leap from 6 to 7, honestly, is significant. And so I think it is going to cause a lot of people to kind of to raise those questions. As long as we have to do a crap ton of work anyway, should we be looking at these other systems? So when you come back to why Drupal over CQ5, WordPress, and some of these other things, and, and that's a valid question to ask. Um, I kind of look at a, a few different things. Um, the one thing I look at is, is um, everything Dries has said is, is right on. Um, I think a, another big piece to look at is how full Drupal 8 is as a solution. So in the past, you would download Drupal, and that would get you enough to make an ugly blog, and then you would need to like, get like 300 contributed modules to actually make it do something useful. Drupal 8 has a bunch of stuff built in out of the box. It has all the content modeling tools you need, so entity reference, um, date module, all these kinds of things are built in automatically out of the box. It also has views built in, so you can do your sidebar blocks, your resting pages, all those kinds of things. I don't know of the other tools that I've looked at, and I haven't looked at all of them, but I've looked at a lot of them that are really geared in that way, where in one product you can handle everything from modeling out how your content is gonna be structured, um, automatically generating, you know, semantic structured, uh, you know, forms to enter that data in a way, though, that it can be output in many different formats. So not just assuming everything's going to be a web page, but also outputting it as REST to be consumed by a mobile application or outputting it as something. And I know you're a nonprofit, but but despite the fact that you're a nonprofit, you still have the same needs that other people do, where a lot of your users are on, you know, mobile devices and they need to get information fast and easy. So having the mobile friendliness out of the box in Drupal 8 with the responsive everything and the, um, you know, the support for some of these you know, APIs and, and web services and stuff, that's going to help you as well. So I would, um, and the, you know, and if the product features themselves that come out in Drupal 8.0 aren't enough to make that case, which, you know, other people have great features too. Um, there's two other aspects that I think are important. One is the security team of Drupal, um, because the security team is amazing, and they cover not only the Drupal core product itself, but also any official releases of contributed projects as well. And so that means like if you download a, an external app, you know, like plugin for something like WordPress, that's on some developer's blog and there's no way to get, you know, make sure that there's a standard process for getting, you know, notifications about any issues that might be there. So that's actually a really big benefit that Drupal has that I don't believe any other open source or proprietary, frankly, solution has is that sort of central team, you know, handling the management of those essays to make sure that users are informed of what's going on. And I think the other thing that's really exciting about versions of Drupal past Drupal 8.0, so 8.1, 8.2, is we're entering this world where actually we can start to innovate within Drupal core pretty fast. And so as we see things happening like, oh wow, the path auto module is amazing, we can actually pull that into core um, in 8.1 or 8.2 in one of these six month feature releases, and now that stuff is available out of the box for everyone to use. And so you'll, what you'll see is that Drupal 8.0 is already starting as a very full-featured CMS. It's only going to get better as time goes on. 
Um, and, and I think if you can make the leap to eight, which I know will be significant for some people, um, that, that will really set you up in a future-proof way for the next X years. Because we're not going to rewrite our thing to be OO again, I hope. <laughs> um, so, so that's a good thing. And the other thing that I've emphasized too, if you are on Drupal 6, how many people are on Drupal 6 still or have Drupal 6 sites that you're looking at? Yeah. So a couple of things for you. Um, the first thing is that one of the release blockers to even shipping Drupal 8 is to make sure that all of the like really bad Drupal 6 security issues, if any, are addressed prior to shipping 8.0. So that is, a, that is a blocker, is we have to make sure any, if there are any highly critical or moderately critical, whatever the top two severity of, of security issues are, there can't be any of those in the private issue tracker, we will not ship Drupal 8. So it's not like when Drupal 8 ships and three months pass and the community drops support for Drupal 6, your site's immediately gonna get compromised and horrible demons are gonna come out of your computer, right? Like we really are trying our best to set Drupal 6 off in the sunset on a, on a good, stable, you know, foundation. Um, so that's one thing. The second thing is that the, the core team really rec recognizes that importance, like of how fundamental Drupal 6 was to the success that you see now of Drupal 8 or I'm sorry, of, Drupal, of the Drupal community. And so, you know, things like the migration team has prioritized putting Drupal 6 to 8 migrations in way ahead of Drupal 7 to 8 even. So like, I'm sad because I have a Drupal 7 blog and I want to move it to 8 and I can't, but um, they're really prioritizing the people who are going to be left out to make sure that they have the tools they need to move forward. So that's about all I can say about Drupal 6. But is that helpful at all or? Oh yeah, it's been very helpful. Awesome. Um, I had one specific question about um, multilingual or translation stuff, and it seems two years ago that you guys were doing a lot with uh, Drupal 8 in in that respect, and I wondered if that might be something that's not available in other CMSs that you guys also have. That part I haven't evaluated, so I don't know that as well. I know there yeah. are other systems that do do it better than us, but I think they have other weaknesses that we have, so I think um, I think that's a little bit of a wash. Okay. Um, we do it really well, and it's a lot more integrated into Drupal 8, but I think you can still find systems that do multilingual better than us for now. <laughs> but we'll slowly kick their butts, you know, over Great. time. So. Well, thank <laughs> you very much. I, yeah. I think we do it better than most others, maybe with the exception of a few proprietary solutions, yeah. specifically multilingual. Certainly better than a, a lot of the, the main open source CMSs. I think that yeah. Drupal 8's multilingual support is, is comparatively excellent. Yeah. The other thing I'll say, and feel free to, to go back to your chair, because uh, it's uh, you know you've been standing there for a long time, um, and I, I don't want to drag out his answer, but uh, one of the things that I do is I talk to uh, industry analysts, and so you know to, to back up for a second, the way a lot of organizations you know buy a CMS, and I use air quotes here, is either they go to a digital agency or a Drupal shop and you know, they recommend the technology solution. In the case of a Drupal shop, obviously that would be Drupal, but a lot of digital agencies use multiple different solutions. Or they go to an industry analyst, and, it's, um, and they say, here's all the things I wanna do, here's my requirements, and they then take them through a process, and they say, you should look at these two solutions. Right, that, that's what they do, and a lot of people use those uh, organizations. Examples are Forrester and Gartner and, and many more. And, um, and so one of the things I do is I go to these uh, organizations and I help them understand you know, all of the changes in Drupal 8. And uh, I can't say who said what, but uh, one of them said, you know, Drupal 8 is the biggest advancement that I've seen in the last five years. In, in, in the industry that we're in, obviously. Um, and so he's very excited uh, about the things in Drupal 8. And so, um, long answer short, um, depending on your organization, you may want to talk to industry analysts to help you identify what the best solution is, and hopefully that answer will lead to Drupal. <laughs> so, next question. And by the way, if other people have questions, now would be a good time to to line up, I think. Hi, I'm Marcus. I work mostly as a freelance consultant. Uh, my question touches on something you mentioned earlier, Angie, about uh, versioning. Um, that's we're making some very big technical changes in Drupal. We're changing the entire framework of, of how we're building it. We're changing to Symfony, and, it's, and we're changing a lot of things about the way we use namespaces and so on. So there's lots of technical changes that we're, we're building up. 
And also we're talking about changing things like the way we release things and changing the versioning. And I wonder if it's maybe all a little bit too much to release in one big bang. Uh, and contrib authors might have a challenge as to working out with the versions, backward compatibility, how do I link and so on. Is it possible that we could consider postponing any version changes or any process changes until maybe a year after Drupal 8 is out and has had a time to, to bed in and see whether or not they are actually needed in, uh, at all? Um, it's probably a question for you, Dries. I guess, because you've asked me, I would mm. say, um, I would say that's probably gonna happen naturally anyway. Like, I anticipate 8.1.x is gonna be more or less a bug fix release. Like, you know, uh, maybe a few new APIs to help contrib authors move on things that they weren't able to do because, oops, we forgot that honeypot module needs something or whatever, you know, that kind of stuff. I don't anticipate any really big bang changes happening in the first point release. So the second point release, or sorry, the second minor release, 8.2, wouldn't be for a year after Drupal 8 anyway. And that is probably when we'd start to see some like new user facing features and things like that start to pop up is what I'm anticipating. So I think that might happen organically and naturally anyway. The other thing that's gonna happen, I predict, is once 8.0.0 comes out, everybody who's been slogging away for four years is probably gonna take an enormous vacation, or I really <laughs> hope they do. And so, um, yes. Can I get a, can I get a round of applause? Yes. So vacations, those are good. Um, yeah, so I, I actually don't, if, if it moved too fast, we'd have to address that problem. I don't actually think that's a risk. I actually think it's more of a risk that we burn people out and we don't end up, you know, rising to the, uh, you know, being able to rise to the opportunity that we have here, which is not to, you know, shift Drupal 8 with the same thing that was cool four years ago like Drupal 7 is right now. So, um, so I don't know for sure, but I, I wouldn't be as worried because... Uh, most of that stuff is just process changes anyway, and we can sort of, we, you know, we're, we can be agile about it. We can try it. If it's not working, we can scale it back, or we can, you know, there, there's a lot of different things we can do. So, but that wasn't a really great answer. I don't know if Jess or Dries or Alex. Uh, I will also say that actually, I think it makes a ton of sense, and, and the decision is kind of decided. So we have a we have a schedule, a six month schedule for minor releases that is going to start kicking as soon as we release 8.0. Um, but I think it makes a ton of sense to switch to semantic versioning and these, these faster six-month releases now because what we've just done is we've just spent four years cleaning up maybe I, I, like 10 years of, of technical debt in a way um, by modernizing the code base, um, which in, in a way that hopefully will allow us to innovate more quickly without breaking backward compatibility. That's the big point of semantic versioning is that we add new functionality, um, we can deprecate things, we add new APIs, but we do it in a way that's predictable and we do it without breaking BC. I don't think that we could have really done that as effectively in Drupal 7. I think that we're in a much better position in terms, architecturally in terms of what Drupal 8 is uh, to do that in the future and then um, Drupal 9 will not, the, the Drupal 9 branch won't even be open for development um, until we actually do think we need to break BC stuff or something. So. Great question, thank you. Hi, my name's uh, Grant Kruger. I work for a foundation out of Oregon. And uh, we have a Drupal 6 site we're gonna upgrade. And I decided to skip 7. I can't see any major benefit because I, I ported back all the functionality from 7. and So they'll just have new ways of doing things. And so I've decided to go with 8. We'll start coding in about three months and I Everything I see suggests that eight is the only way to go right now, and I guess my question is, am I insane? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> or at least it's not, <laughs> not for that you reason. You cannot diagnose your. <laughs> <laughs> it's not for wanting to use. use, use <laughs> I mean, I, I worked for Chapter Three uh, about a month ago. We launched a Fortune 500 company on Drupal 8. Phase two just was here talking about their, their launch of a Drupal 8 site. People are launching Drupal 8 sites right now, so it, it is viable as long as you have the, the team to support you in doing that. So you, you, you need developers who are involved in the core process because then they'll be aware of upcoming changes, things to avoid, um, to, to make like keeping up to date with the latest changes of Drupal possible. Yeah, it, it does seem like uh, pay now or pay later. 
um, and if you pay later, you pay more. It's like a payday loan. <laughs> well, and, and also in three months' time, if we're not uh, um, release candidates, then I need a holiday. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I'm going to leaven that with a couple of caveats. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I think that Drupal 8 betas are actually more stable than the early point releases of Drupal 7 after release. Um, but that said, it is still a beta release. It is still not officially supported. So if you have the resources, or if you have a long project that you're starting to do R&D for now, and then it makes sense to start looking at Drupal 8 as a solution. But if you have limited resources, um, the, you need to be aware that, that Drupal 8, it might not be the right time. Drupal 7 is still a fantastic release of Drupal. If you're going from Drupal 6 to Drupal 8, that's smart. Um, but if you're building new sites now and you need a new site within the next three to six months, Drupal 7 is still great. One thing that you won't get with Drupal 8 is um, security issues are still in the public queue. Uh, so if there, is, if there are vulnerabilities that affect only Drupal 8, they will be filed publicly. That means that anyone on the internet, if they're clever and figure out that your site is on Drupal 8 beta, can, knows that your site is vulnerable to that bug. Um, there also is not a supported upgrade path yet, um, like between patches, like between betas or between between patches made to Drupal 8 core. So on a, we're not breaking stuff as frequently as we were six months ago, but there's still, you'll still run into situations from time to time uh, where you, if it, when you update your site, you will, something will break horribly. There is a uh, project we've sponsored in Contrib, uh, the head-to-head -head project that provides those updates in Contrib. Um, but it's, it's not officially supported the way that core updates will be once we get um, further in, along in the beta release process. So those two caveats you should keep in mind. It's a great idea, but it's not for everyone. And if you, ha if you're, if you have a limited budget, um, then you should probably wait for our support. Hi. Sorry. Um, I'm Mike. There's been talk of getting a new theme into core. Is that possible at this stage? Is it possible to make it a default? Um, or is that something, you know, for one of the point releases afterwards? Yeah, so actually, it was, you know, it's a great question. To be honest, I don't have uh, a quick answer um, on that. Um, I haven't actually kept up with that discussion because we've been so focused on other things. Um, so I don't know where, where that is actually right now, if there's consensus on that or not. I don't know, maybe you guys know. Um, um, the question was whether there is still an opportunity to add a new theme to core, right? Do we have any uh, of the contributors who have been working on Consensus Banana in the, in the house? Scott, do you have anything you'd like to say at the mic <laughs> about the current status of the theme system and future themes? Thank you. So I think... This is, his, this is Kotzer. He works for Digital Echidna and his name is Scott. Thank you. Thank you for the <laughs> intro. So um, my answer as one of the theme system maintainers for Drupal 8 would be uh, not until 8 is out. Um, maybe after that point we could look at adding things in an 8.1 or 8.2 or something, but um, right, now, right now one of the things that we're doing is just trying to, um, I'm not going to go into detail, but we've got the classy base theme in core. Uh, some of you may have heard of that. Um, and that's fairly recent, um, so we're just kind of making sure that that's good and then doing some cleanup on the non-classy kind of markup and templates, and that's basically all we're going to do for the 8 release. But your, you know, contrib can do whatever it wants, so. Yeah, I th and I think in general, like anything that we add now um, introduces risk of delaying the release even more, right? Even if it, the risk is low, there is risk and the the opportunity cost, if you will, of delaying the release, you know, we have to think carefully if it's worth adding this new thing versus potentially delaying the release. And so for me, adding a new theme would have to have a really, really compelling reason. And so the question would be, how important is this to add it now versus adding it later? And so I think that, that is the core of, of that conversation. But And so I don't know where that discussion is, but Next question. Hi, my name is Carman German Moreno. I work for uh, Mire.org, uh, but I also do a lot of contracting work for the federal government. And uh, it's, uh, I love Drupal all, all the way since 
yeah, 2006, something like that. It's been, it's been good. But uh, still, uh, I feel like uh, with this release of the Drupal 8, it comes with a lot of changes on obviously the addition of the uh, new framework. That is great. Uh, it's just, uh, I'm thinking, is, is there any um, roadmap or any idea on perhaps enhancing uh, the, um, the way that the developers are able just to contribute, contribute back to the, to the core? As it is already, it's kind of a little bit cumbersome feel. It's, it's not like a straightforward process. So uh, perhaps along with uh, all these enhancements that are, uh, are coming in the Drupal 8, would it be uh, also good, uh, good time and just to enhance all that process, perhaps make it a little bit more modern, like uh, something like a uh, GitHub, uh, something along that line. So is there any roadmap on en enhancing the contributing to the core, to the projects? So I, I didn't catch quite all of that. I think what I heard is, um, are there any, is there any work being done to the collaboration tools on Drupal.org to make it easier for people to contribute to core? Correct, no, that's, that's correct. Okay, um, so I know of one thing that's a big deal, and then I know there were other sessions at DrupalCon actually talking about this, so it's a good, it's a good question. So one, you know, one thing that always comes up is like, why is Drupal using their own homegrown Drupal-powered issue queue thingy thing and not just using GitHub like every other project does? Um, and that comes up a lot. And so there was a great session uh, called Issue Workspaces um, uh, done by the Drupal Association folks who um, answer that question and then also go on to describe what they plan to do to the issue queues themselves to better integrate Git um, into what effectively amounts to um, centralized pull requests that are all off the same issue. Um, as opposed to GitHub pull requests which are decentralized and kind of a mess to keep track of. So um, what they plan to do, I'm gonna try and summarize an hour long talk in like two minutes. <laughs> uh -huh. But what they plan to do um, is use the Git namespaces feature to effectively um, set up each issue as its own repository um, behind the scenes. So from an end user perspective, it's gonna look a lot like GitHub where there's a, there's a button that you press to say like fix this issue and then it will spin up a branch in the background that you can use. Um, and then any commits that are done end up on the branch itself. They're gonna put some in-place editing tools in there so that um, if you're trying to fix a documentation bug or whatever, you can just do it right in the browser. You don't actually have to use Git at all. Um, and um, essentially using the actual Git-based workflow behind the scenes on the issue so we no longer have to deal with patch files and stuff. Um, but they're still gonna keep the old patch style workflow for people who need it and kind of run both in parallel. So that's one big initiative that they're doing and there's an issue open for that. I don't know the you are off the top of my head, but if you go to the session node for DrupalCon LA, it would be there um, where they're talking a lot about how they plan to do that. And as far as I know, that's still on the plan for this year to start rolling out some of the, the functionality and features of that. And I, I'm really excited about that because it's, um, you know, the way we currently use Git is basically as a replacement for CVS, which is what we used before Git, where Git is a version control system but we don't actually use it like you would, like we use it like most people would use a centralized version control system. So there's like a canonical thing over here and then you work in your local and then you can send things back and forth. Um, this would be a lot more collaborative and a lot more using what Git is actually made um, to do. So that's actually really exciting. And then I know Kathy and Kalpana and Peter Willannon and a couple of other people had sessions about how to make the actual contribution process easier and less steps and that kind of thing, but I don't know what happened at those discussions. But if one of you would like to take the mic and update that, that would be excellent. Because yeah, it is a big barrier to entry, for sure. Um, and I think as much as we can do to make it easier and more streamlined for people, yeah, for sure. Yeah, Kathy. so if you wanna see, um, introduce yourself, sorry. <laughs> I'm Kathy, I'm uh, YesCT, uh, I work for Black Mesh and my job is to um, help make Drupal. Um, so if you wanna see the plans for improvements and the status of them, I would actually recommend that you look at my talk that I gave um, because the slides are online as a web page, and they have links to the issues and it'll be like one of the fastest ways to get to that information. Um, and it's github.com slash 
Drupal dash mentoring uh, slash whatever, the one that says like um, D.0 changes to improve contributor experience. I will tweet the link. Thanks. Um, yeah, so the, the tricky thing about keeping track of those kinds of things is really like how do you, like knowing what, what the issues are so you can see where we're discussing things. So that's like an index of where the discussions are. Um, yeah. The good news is that um, the DA staff uh, is making improvements to how we can improve Drupal.org and also investing resources in improving Drupal.org. So our um, contributor experience is going to be getting better. Um, like they're, they're doing a really good job and they're dedicating resources, um, uh, not specifically to the issues that I picked, but in general, uh, the, the um, it changes there are, are accelerating. So we can, we can be smartly hopeful. Awesome, thank you for the help there. And then that issue workspaces node is, which maybe Jess can tweet that too, uh, 248-8266. That's 248-8266. Awesome. Next question, please. Um, Pala from the government of Sierra Leone. Um, I work for a ministry wherein we develop policies and we are actually in the process of setting up policies for the government in uh, selecting a specific CMS for government website. So I want to give a recommendation, but I want you to convince me how I can suggest to the government to use Drupal as the standard platform for all government websites without it being looked as an anti-competitive approach. Thank you. I can take a crack at this. <laughs> <laughs> so actually one of the things we've seen in other governments is um, you know, that they have begun to standardize on Drupal. Uh, and so I think the reason why is because Drupal is unique in the sense that it can run small websites and large websites, simple websites and complex websites. And a lot of government organizations have a variety of websites you know, that fit these different quadrants, if you will. And traditionally, they've used, they've had to use a multitude of different content management systems. For example, for your main website, they would use, you know, whatever enterprise content management system, and then maybe for their smaller websites, you know, they, they couldn't use that same enterprise content management system because it's just not economical. Like you wouldn't use Adobe CQ5 for a microsite or a small event website because it's just too expensive. And so what's unique about Drupal is that it can, you know, scale from large to small, from simple to complex, and that it's probably one of the only platforms out there that you can standardize on across the board. Um, and we see that happening, you know, everywhere. We see that happening in government. For example, the government of Australia they have built a distribution along with, with other people there um, called Gov CMS. And it's a distribution of Drupal, so you may want to look into that distribution. And they basically created a, a mandate to migrate. They're not forcing everybody to migrate, but they're like, you know, highly encouraging everybody to standardize on Gov CMS or Drupal across the Australian government. Um, and we see the same thing happening in you know, commercial organizations. It's not just a government thing, but um, a lot of larger organizations that have hundreds or thousands of websites in some cases are also standardizing on Drupal because it's literally one of the only platforms that you can standardize on. Um, so that would be my answer. And, and there's technical reasons as well, but um, you know. Thank you. Now, we see a pattern with dynamically typed languages. Uh, my name is Asad, hello. <laughs> and we see this pattern with dynamically typed languages uh, as they're introducing partial static typing, such as HHBM from Facebook and all these other platforms. So how do we see Drupal going in that direction, either fully or partially in the future, or do we at all? Is there a purpose for it? 
can, can you repeat the question? I'm not sure I got the question right. Um, so I, I think you asked, like, um, as, as PHP 7 introduces, like, uh, strong, strong typing, the, the ability to type in on um, scalars, like strings and things, are we going to adopt that? Um, simply for Drupal 8, that won't be an option because we're going to support PHP 5 point whatever it is when we release, but it will be a 5 point release. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Way to dodge that bullet. <laughs> <laughs> But I think um, if you look at what Drupal 8 is, is doing is, um, with respect to the way that we treat our data is that we're trying to ensure that we preserve the, the, the types that the developer intends. So like with configuration, we spent a lot of time um, ensuring that when the developer wants that um, integer to be an integer, the moment that they put it in the configuration, it will always be treated as an integer. So we've, we've adopted like s um, some of that uh, practices already in, in Drupal 8. But I think when Drupal 9 is around, it, it will be something that we will look at. If we, we will introduce it in areas where it will help us build a um, repeatable and reliable system, it probably won't fit for forms, for example. We do uh, also do type hinting everywhere in Drupal 8, so that helps a little bit where we can say we specifically expect an entity type interface in here, so you can't just throw an array of garbage in there and it will do something. So that. We're taking baby steps in that area, but I agree that we can't go full hog on that until we require PHP 7 as the baseline. Although PHP 7 looks awesome from what I've seen. It's way faster than PHP 5, and it looks pretty cool. Awesome. Hi, my name is Juan. I work for Woodstack. Uh, OK, we are in Woodstack uh, making some experiments with Drupal 8. Uh, the, and there are two guys that, well, they came from Symfony. Um, they tested Drupal 8 and trying to develop some stuff and, well, uh, they they didn't w agree with much stuff. So uh, they asked me some questions that takes me to think that they may not uh, know about how, uh, why some stuff were done like it's done now in Drupal 8. For example, they asked me, uh, why um, why don't why do you don't save uh, why don't you why you don't use the cache system of Symfony and you still keep cache in in the database like Drupal 7 was doing or stuff like uh, why the plugin system is too is so, such complicated uh, or uh, stuff like that may, and that may be because uh, they don't know that may, they may don't know that there is a, should be a reason for that. So, how can I tell them, or how can I show them that uh, the reasons that dr the reasons that why some stuff were built uh, the way it's built in Drupal 8? So we have one really good tool for that at a very granular level, like your question about why is the plugin system the way it is, or those kinds of things, and that is change records which we publish for any API change we make. There is a change record, which I might stop talking soon and let you start talking, but I'll just like say a thing. Um, so if you have a question about anything in Drupal 8, you can look this up. And change records are effectively documentation of what happened in Drupal 7, how it works in Drupal 8, and then they link off to the discussions that happen to bring you the answer to that question. We don't have really great documentation I'm aware of that is in a actual consumable form that's because that's it's not really fun to read like 200 issue uh, or 200 common issues yes, to figure out the Actually, answer. that's another problem. They told me that they, it's hard for them to find documentation, but well, it's uh, beta software, so yeah, yeah. It, can, it can be expected too much documentation. I think so until maybe a release candidate, but I don't know if... Well, uh, if, if there is such documentation for those kind of cha of changes, well, I think that could that could be a, a nice tool to for them mm -hmm. to look at. Maybe. So api.drupal.org actually has complete, not perfect, but it has documentation for all of the code, all of the code documentation that's in cores there, and it also includes high-level topic summaries. So if you go to api.drupal.org, there should be a, and, and click on Drupal eight. There should be a link there for the plugin topic, and that will give an overview of how the plugin system works. Um, that doesn't quite address the question of why is it so complicated, is what I heard. Um, but uh, there, it, it does give a, actually a fairly systematic overview explaining it.
think there was another question there too. I which missed the first one. Oh, yeah, which <laughs> was basically, why are we using some parts of symphony and not other parts of symphony? Um, or why are we using this bit of symphony but not that bit of symphony when they both seem yeah, like something like that. Uh, yeah. Because they use symphony uh, and they know some ways to do stuff with symphony and when they do by a comp, no, use this way, not right. symphony way. Mm -hmm. So a lot of those areas are places where, not all, and I'll shut up and let Alex talk. I don't know why I'm talking. I have a microphone in my hand, so I'm just taking it away. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, a lot of those things are because um, Symphony is a framework for developers, and so um, the way it works in Symphony is you are, it's, it's by developers, for developers, you're doing everything from your command line and your IDE, and that's how things are done. Mm -hmm. uh, Drupal is, has two audiences, it has developers, but it also has site builders who click through everything. And it is mind-blowing to Symphony people that we, for example, our routing system needs to be able to tackle hundreds of paths, because in a sip typical Symphony application, you know, you're writing a blog, so you have like four URLs. You have blog, blog user, whatever, like this kind of thing. Whereas Drupal will expose a route for every single admin path, of which there are hundreds. And so I would say that that's one of the challenges that we've run into a few times with Symphony is that they don't have these, um, these sort of like constraints where uh, we're exposing a UI for code configuration effectively everywhere. Um, that is not something that is done in these other frameworks because in the other frameworks you just edit a YAML file or whatever and that's how you configure things. So it has to do with the fact that Drupal's target audience is very different from Symphony's in order to keep the power of Drupal in that it is a tool for non-technical people to build amazing things. We need to do some things that are a little bit different. So that's why we had to, for example, subclass the routing system um, of, of Symphony and not quite use exactly what they do. Do you have anything to add to that, Bill? Yeah, I mean, generally, Drupal 8 is, is more complex than Symphony because it's a product and Symphony itself is a framework. Um, mm. And we've built a framework on top of Symphony where we, we use a lot, of what, a lot of the good stuff that they've done, but we've also got some of our own ideas um, with, s with <coughs> specific uh, reference to the question that you asked. You asked about why don't we use the, the Symphony um, well, <coughs> caching is, is, is quite application specific. We've had to introduce like masses of work in Drupal 8 to bubble up cache tags, and Wim Liz has done incredible work on that. And if we'd leveraged the, the Symphony caches to work with the way that, the way that it works with the, the, the request, that would have been much harder to do. Because we are building a product that's using our own framework, we can do that. So we've leveraged the parts which work for us, and we've, we've chosen not to, when we need something specific for the product that we need to build. Okay, so thanks a lot. Thank you for the question. Go for it. Matt 2000, shout out, card.com. So yesterday, somebody wearing Larry Garfield's ga vest, I totally screwed up that joke, damn. <laughs> Larry Garfield's vest, it's a joke, right? Okay, sorry. He gave a presentation on saying no. Um, and you know, he made the point that if you try to be the uh, jack of all trades, you're the master of none. And I noticed today everyone kind of equivocated on the multilingual question, whereas you know, six years ago or so, I think Drupal was clearly the leading CMS for multilingual, certainly in open like source. I totally uh, like crapped the bed with that question. Schnitzel, could you go up to the mic and after he's done and talk about how awesome Drupal 8's multilingual is? Okay, so multi, multi, multilingual is not the point. It's just, it's just an example of, of an area where maybe we've fallen behind because we're doing so many other things, right? So my question uh, is the opposite of what others have asked, you know, how can I sell Drupal uh, for my projects? Um, my question is, what is a web application that you would say Drupal is not the right tool for? Google.com. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry? Oh, we all want to borrow it? Yes. So Jess thinks Drupal is good for everything. So no, no. Cool. I, I would say that that um, there, there's always, you know, there's two factors when you're picking what solution you're going to use. There's um, what resources you have and what their expertise is, and um, then there's your particular application. And I, I think that, uh, you know, our, a lot of us have jobs where our job is evaluating what the correct solution for something is. So, 
if you have a site and, and WordPress works great and you have a team of people who, who know WordPress really well and, they, and that's the solution that works for you, that's awesome, right? Use it, do whatever works in your budget, um, but you know, let, you know, evaluate your requirements. If you, if you want to build, um, if you have a complex like data modeling use case, and then you start to build it in WordPress, then you might find later that you wish you'd chosen a different solution. But I, no, that's, I agree with Google.com, yeah. <laughs> I wouldn't build Twitter on Google. <laughs> um, but yeah, so it's uh, as just to echo what Jeff said, it's about evaluating your requirements. But more importantly than evaluating like your current requirements is also to have some thought for the future. Where do you want to be in two, three years time? What do you want your application to do? And then look at which solution can satisfy 80, 90% of that. And I think when you do that, if you look at, if you expect your, 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 your application to grow and have to hook into like many different parts of the web and have thousands of people contribute back to a, the product that you're using that might already have an integration with them, you can make them Drupal the way that you and Drupal 8 is. And my favorite answer to this is Drupal is for clients who don't know what they want. Mm -hmm. Because you, if anybody have clients like that? Mm -hmm. Some people are like, yes, but they're sitting right next to me. <laughs> 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 But if, you're, if your client knows exactly what they want and a better tool is a better fit for that, do that. If your client doesn't know what they want, even if a better tool looks like it might be a good to fit for that, Drupal's probably, maybe, you have to, it depends on the client, but like, and I, I don't know how many times when I was a freelancer I got into a situation where a client thought the only thing that they wanted was a brochureware site. So for that, I would say like nowadays it would be whatever Sculpin or something like that. And then you come to find out, well actually, we also want a shopping cart for that thing. Oh, by the way, can it do slideshows? And is there a wiki and stuff? And in Drupal, that's like four checkboxes. Kidding. But you know what I mean? It's, it's essentially, <laughs> you know, we, we wrote a book literally on like how to do like 15 different use cases with just checking checkboxes with no code. And, um, and Drupal is fantastic for that. Um, but uh, I think if, if it is a situation where you clearly know the requirements and you should always pick the right tool for the job. And Drupal is the right tool for a lot of jobs, but definitely not for all of them. So, yeah. um, I just want to point out that we have about five minutes left in this session, so I think that we have one more person that has a question. Um, maybe we could take potentially one more question after that, and then we should wrap uh, it up. No, no, no. We'll take his no? question then seriously. Can you oh, end the session schnitzel. with telling Actually, us how awesome that's a good idea. <laughs> okay. Uh, hi, uh, I'm Tamba, and I work for Accenture. I have a question for the panel and it's a question that I've been thinking about for a while. I know Drupal 8 is great and it's uh, focused on headless, mobile and all these great things. And let's assume I, I'm a customer and I really love all these good features of Drupal 8 and I want to use Drupal 8. But I have a use case where in I have my app, it's built in, let's say any other framework, example, Java-based app, and I just want to use Drupal as a front-end instead of use Drupal as a back-end. But I want to use Drupal 8 and not 7, and I want to use it right now. <laughs> what would you recommend? Boy, that's quite a list of requirements. So you know what you want. That's great. Yes. <laughs> um, so the, the question, I think, if I can just repeat it back, is um, I want to do headless development, so I want a custom front-end that is not Drupal at all, but I want it to talk to a Drupal... No, Sorry? no, I want to reverse that. I want to reverse what you just said. You want to use Drupal as the front end, but something else as the back end? Something else is the back end that have APIs exposed, and I want to suck those APIs, those, the content out of that back end and use Drupal to create, update, and delete, and also display as my front end. Because I just like okay. Drupal, and I want to use Drupal. Right. OK. Um, yeah, so Drupal 8 has a couple of things that can let you do that. Um, we have a web services API via Guzzle, which is an external PHP library that would let you call out to, if the thing that you're integrating with exposes web services, you can integrate with them in Drupal. Views module also has um, the ability to 
use custom backends. I don't think I'm lying about this because I'm pretty sure I did this with a, a custom SQL table one time. Um, so that would be one approach, I guess. I haven't done a lot of this work in my professional life, but I know a, lot, I know a lot of people are doing that even with Drupal 6 and 7. Um, yeah. So I don't think it would be uh, not yeah. impossible, but I don't know that Drupal 8 did a lot to make that I've easier. I've seen it yeah. in... Um, just, just to add before you ask, I don't want to store any of this information in the Drupal database. Yeah, yeah, I understand. Right. Yep. So I've seen this, I've seen this actually in, uh, in quite a few cases. One example is Puma.com. As an example, it's a large e-commerce website. Um, you know, they use a uh, they use demandware in this specific case for their commerce piece, and so demandware stores a lot of data. Stores a you know has the PIM system, the product information management uh, system, which has all the information about the products. They also manage the users. In this case, so when you sign up, the user account is actually managed in demandware, and they use Drupal to build a very rich you know digital experience on top of the commerce backend. And so they store all of the data in the backend. The data is syndicated into Drupal, so sometimes Drupal keeps a copy of the data, but it's not the canonical version. And then, you know, does, the, does its thing to visualize the data in, in very creative ways, because that's typically where e-commerce systems fall behind. Um, you know, they don't have strong content management capability. So a very common use case in commerce. and. Um, there's solutions that do that today. I'm not sure if that answers our question, but uh, it, it is it is done frequently. Not in Drupal 8, though. Would you recommend Drupal 8 for that today? S sorry? Would you recommend I use I, Drupal I 8 for that today? I think these use cases get much easier in Drupal 8, yes. I think Drupal 8 will be able to do that much more efficiently and um, you know faster. So, so I, I would recommend that. Okay. But with all the caveats that we talked about earlier, about early adoption. Yes. No, I would just like to add, sometimes you could put like a smart reverse proxy in front of your headless Drupal and the other RPCs and just make the decision which one it should go to and that could probably solve that problem. There you go. So do we want to have Schnitzel talk about... Yes, oh, Schnitzel, awesome. would you be able to step up to the mic I mean, and, awesome. and correct my egregious error from earlier where I was like, I don't know, multilingual, grr, grr. Yeah, so can you make that better? <laughs> so, um, well, basically what I say all the time, in Drupal 7 you need to install 29 modules to have a complete translatable Drupal site. And in Drupal 8 core, it ships out of core. So there are four modules, you install them, and that's all you need, and you can translate everything you ever see. Do you have any information on how Drupal 8's multilingual capabilities compare to like other systems? Um, Look how I have turned this into, <laughs> I reversed the uh, Q&A. <laughs> no, so, so there's one thing that I can tell you definitely that is missing. So first of all, you can translate Drupal 8, you can translate everything. What is missing in 8 right now, there is no translation management. So there is no real way out of the box with core that you can send your translation somewhere else and let someone else translate without contrib. And I think that's a really important thing and when, when we talk about Drupal 8 as a product because especially in enterprise, it's really important to um, not only have a translatable system, to also manage the translations. There are really great contrib systems. There is a Lingotech that does that. There is Team GMT, which is a whole system about that, and there are others as well. Um, but I think at one point it will be important for us as Drupal to provide that, because that's definitely somewhere we're lacking behind all the proprietary software that Therese talked about. Okay, so it sounds yeah. like what you're saying is um, in core, that sort of outsourcing translations piece is missing. However, even in Drupal 7 with contrib, you can easily achieve parity with other uh, right. systems or, or surpass it. Correct, yes. Great, thank you. Thank That's you. Awesome. All right, so unfortunately, we're out of time. Um, I know you have a question, but maybe we can answer it later. Um, I think many of us will be at the, um, the trivia night or just at the closing session. Uh, but I'd like to thank my fabulous panelists and core committers. Um, they, <laughs> they, they work incredibly hard. Um, and so, you know, big thank you to them. And 
as well as for being here. I think the next thing is the closing session. If you guys are interested in that, um, we will see you there. Come to the sprints tomorrow if you want to help with or learn about Drupal 8.